Imagine a computer that doesn't follow your everyday rules, where bits can be 0 and 1 at the same time, and two far apart pieces of information are mysteriously linked. This is the mind-bending world of quantum computing, which uses principles of quantum physics to tackle problems that ordinary computers, even supercomputers, struggle with. In this video, we'll start up with qubits, build up to real algorithms, touch the hardware and error correction, and land on practical applications. By the end, you'll know how quantum computers work, why they matter, and how tools like MGX Deep Research can turn dense research into clear reports, slides, and even quick demos. Let's dive in. A classical bit is like a coin lying flat on the table. It's either heads, zero, or tails, one. That's it, no in between. A qubit is more like a coin spinning in the air. While it spins, it isn't locked into just heads or tails. It has some chance of landing heads, some chance of landing tails. That blend of chances is what we call superposition. So, a qubit might be 50% heads and 50% tails, or 70% heads and 30% tails. And that mix of chances is its quantum state. When you actually catch the coin, that's like measuring the qubit. In that instant, the spinning stops and the qubit chooses one definite outcome, either 0 or 1. You never see it as both. You only see 1 when you look. Think of superposition like having a coin spinning in the air. Instead of picking just heads or tails, the qubit is holding both options, together, with certain probabilities. Now imagine you want to test millions of coins with different starting positions. A normal computer would need to check them one by one. Because a normal computer bit is binary. It's either 0 or 1, never both. If you want to solve a problem that requires checking lots of possibilities, say trying every password or searching a big database, you have to run through those options sequentially. Even if you parallelize with many cores or servers, each bit string is still tested as a single definite case. So in essence, classical computation is deterministic, one input state at a time, producing one output at a time. Now, in a quantum computer, because each qubit can represent multiple possibilities at once, it's like tossing all of those coins in parallel inside a single system. A qubit in superposition doesn't choose 0 or 1 until you measure it. While it's unmeasured, it mathematically holds both options at once, weighted by probabilities. With multiple qubits, you can represent a superposition of many combinations simultaneously. For example, one qubit is two possible states at once. Two qubits is four states at once. And 10 qubits is 1024 states at once. This explosion of states means a quantum computer can process all of those possibilities in parallel, inside the same system. Quantum algorithms then manipulate these probabilities through interference, so that when you finally measure the chance of hitting the correct solution is amplified. Now you might be thinking, so one qubit basically the same as two normal bits? Not quite. A single bit can only be a zero or a one. Two bits give you four possible combinations. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. But at any moment, they only hold one of those. Say one, zero. Now, a qubit changes the game. One qubit can sit in a mix of zero and one at the same time. Two qubits can hold all four combinations at once. Add a third and you have got 8. And in general, n qubits can represent 2 power n possibilities simultaneously. And that's the real difference. Classical bits store one answer, while qubits carry entire libraries of possibilities in superposition. So far, we have focused on single qubits and how we can control their state. But the real magic begins when qubits start working together. Entanglement is a special correlation that can exist between qubits. When two qubits are entangled, their states become linked such that if you observe one, you instantly know something about the other, even if they are separated by large distances. As IBM puts it, entanglement is the ability of qubits to intrinsically link with each other. Measuring one immediately influences the state of its partner. And this isn't due to any signal passing between them, no magic communications or wires. It's just how nature works at the quantum level. Albert Einstein famously called it spooky action at a distance and it's a fundamental resource for quantum computing. With entanglement, 
a group of qubits can coordinate in ways classical bits never could, allowing quantum computers to process certain complex problems with breathtaking efficiency. Superposition lets each qubit explore many possibilities at once, and entanglement ties qubits together so they act in harmony. These two concepts form the backbone of quantum computing's power. For example, with two classical bits, you can store one of four possible values at a time. But two qubits in superposition can effectively represent all four values simultaneously until measured. If those qubits are entangled in just the right way, a quantum algorithm can then use their combined state to perform computations that consider multiple inputs at once, and then use interference to amplify the correct answers. So once you have superposition and entanglement working together, quantum computers can use interference to amplify the right outcomes and cancel out the wrong ones. That's where their true power comes from. Think of qubits like ripples on a pond. When two ripples meet, sometimes they add up to make a bigger wave, which is also known as constructive interference. And sometimes they cancel each other out to make the water flat, also known as destructive interference. Quantum states behave the same way. Their probabilities can reinforce or cancel depending on how we apply gates. So when you finally measure them, you'll only see one result, like picking just one page out of the whole library. The trick of quantum algorithms is to set up a math so that wrong answers can cancel each other out, and the right answer is the one that's most likely to pop out when you measure. Now, when we talk about a qubit state, physicists often draw something called the block sphere. It's just a globe we use as a map. At the very top of the globe is the pure zero state. At the very bottom is the pure one state. A classical bit could only sit at one of these poles. But a qubit is different. It can point anywhere on the globe. Tilt it a little toward the bottom and you are saying it's mostly one with a chance of zero. Tilt it toward the equator and you are saying it's a perfect 50-50 mix. Now, to move the qubit around the globe, we use operations called quantum gates. If you think about classical computers, they are built from logic gates. And, or, not. These gates flip or combine bits to perform operations. Quantum computers work the same way in principle, but their gates act on qubits instead of classical bits. For example, the simplest quantum gate is the X gate, which is basically the quantum version of not. If the qubit's zero, it flips to one. If it's one, it flips to zero, straightforward. Then there is the Hadamard gate, which is a simple flip, it's a mixer. If the qubit is definitely zero, Hadamard transforms it into equal mix of zero and one. If a qubit starts locked in a zero at the North Pole, the Hadamard gives it a perfect twist so that it now sits on the equator, half zero, half one. In everyday language, it's like taking a coin that was flat on the table showing heads and giving it a perfect spin in the air so it's equally likely to land heads or tails. That's the magic. By stacking many of these gates, we choreograph how qubits spin and tilt. And that's how quantum circuits are built. <laughs> they are like the dance routines for probabilities, steering the qubits toward the answer we want. Now that we know what qubits are and how we can nudge them around with gates, let's see what we can actually do with them. And this is where quantum algorithms come in. Classical algorithms solve problems step by step, one possibility at a time. Quantum algorithms take advantage of superposition and interference to explore many possibilities in parallel. Then cancel out the wrong ones and highlight the right answer. Take Grover's algorithm. For example, imagine searching a giant phone book with millions of names. A classical computer might need to flip through. On average, half the entries before finding the right one. Grover's algorithm can find the name in only about the square root of that number of steps, which is a massive speed up for huge datasets. Then there is Shor's algorithm, which goes after a very specific but very important problem, factoring large numbers. Why does that matter? Because modern encryption methods like RSA rely on the fact that factoring big numbers is hard for classical computers. Shor's algorithm can do it exponentially faster on a quantum computer. And that's why quantum computing is sometimes seen as a future threat to today's cryptography. Now that we have seen how qubits, gates, and interference work, let's bring in a modern tool that can actually help us explore the space without needing a PhD in quantum physics. 
It's called MGX Deep Research. By the way, a big thanks to MGX for sponsoring this video. I have been using their tool for a while and it actually helped me put this video together. MGX and ChatGPT Deep Research both aim to automate complex, multi-step research, but they work very differently. ChatGPT's Deep Research is like a solo researcher. It browses the web, reads sources, and writes reports on its own. MGX, on the other hand, functions like an entire AI team working together. At the start of any project, the Deep Research agent called Iris kicks things off by gathering reliable market data, collecting sources, and compiling foundational research. Once that base is ready, other specialized agents like the product manager, architect, engineer, and QA step in to structure the findings, design solutions, build tools, and verify results. This collaborative role-based architecture makes MGX far more capable of producing complex, multi-layered outputs such as detailed reports, competitive analysis, APIs, polished side decks, and even prototype applications. For example, I asked MGX to compare classical and quantum cryptography. Iris quickly produced a research foundation with diagrams, timelines, and references. From there, other agents transformed that research into presentation and could even build a Qubit Visualizer app to demonstrate quantum principles interactively. This is far beyond simple summarization. I asked it to build a simple Qubit Visualizer, and it implemented this app for me in minutes. This app lets you pick a Qubit starting state, apply gates like X or Hadamard, and instantly see the probability of measuring 0 or 1. It even plots the little arrow on the block sphere we just talked about. Now, MGX uses Superbase as its backend, and there's a lot to learn from how these systems operate behind the scenes and stay resilient at scale. During Superbase Select, Paul, the CEO and co-founder, revealed how they managed over 9 million Postgre databases. By the way, this segment is sponsored by Superbase. Do check them out. They are doing pretty cool things with Postgres. After five years of running over 9 million databases, we've become intimately familiar with some of the scaling challenges that you can face running Postgres. For storage, we're leveraging S3. We're investing in state-of-the-art Postgres engine with Oriole. We're creating ETL tools to replicate Postgres data into S3 buckets. And for orchestration, we're building Multigress. To do that and to lead Multigress, we brought on Sugu, the co-creator of Vites. How is Multigress going to help you from day one? So if you first go to uh, Superbase and sign up, you get a database. So that's the bottom box that you see on the screen. You get that Postgres instance, and under that Postgres instance, you have actually uh, a mounted storage, something like EBS, uh, elastic storage. So why do you need that elastic storage? Is because uh, your uh, instance may crash. If it crash, you don't want your data to be lost. And so uh, EBS basically is replicated storage, makes sure that you never lose your data. So worst case scenario, you restart your Postgres instance and you continue uh, with serving traffic. Here we introduce another component called multi-arc. And in uh, multi-arc, what it will, multi-arc stands for multi-orchestrator. And uh, what this will do is if a primary fails, it will immediately fail over to uh, one of the standby replicas and continue to serve traffic. This sounds very simplistic, but it is one of the hardest problems in computer science because this is actually a consensus problem. And we have beaten this problem to death. All right, guys, I personally enjoyed Sugu's talks, and there are at least two key takeaways. First, Multigrace handles automatic failover through solving the consensus problem, which Sugu mentioned is one of the hardest problems in computer science. It's not about switching to a backup. It's about ensuring all nodes agree on the state without data loss. Second is separating storage from compute using S3 with multi-gateway handling connection pooling. So for apps like MGX, this means better reliability at scale. So if you are building anything with Postgre or considering your backend options, definitely check out the full Superbase Select conference. Quantum computing is still in its early days, but it's already reshaping fields like cryptography, chemistry, and optimization. In our next video, we'll dive deeper into its flagship algorithms, Shores and Grovers, and really see how they put all these principles to work.